Oh, my, my, my. He reigns forever. Put those hands together once more. He reigns forever. Hallelujah. My, my, my. I've missed church. Put those hands together. Wow. I'm back in church. That's the way to welcome him back. Goodness, that's your voice. We have to go and ensure it. You know, Americans are crazy. You know, some people insure beauty. Are you aware? Are you aware? One crazy woman insured her body. The part of her body that's very beautiful, she went to insure it with three million dollars. That nothing should happen. She paid surgery. So said not three million dollars. I just laughed. I said, look at this one. Twenty years from now, the thing will go down. <laughs> we need to insure your voice. So I said, we'll go pay insurance, please. Make sure nothing happens to this voice. Help us preserve it. 20 years. Just keep doing it. Keep doing it. I watched, I watched a program on Netflix. I, 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 I didn't finish it, actually. I, I like the woman, so I didn't want to see the end. Whitney Houston's um, story. I want to dance with somebody. Because I sing that song with my wife every now and then. Some of you think I'm carnal. That's what Funka and I do. It's not for you guys. She and I will say, I want to dance with somebody. So I'll tell my wife, she'll go at this. We'll be doing that to each other. I want to dance with you alone, somebody who loves me. You don't love me, so she loves me. So please, let's, let's get a help. So while watching that, that, that um, documentary about that lovely woman, you know, my heart broke again because she started in church. Her mother was a choir mistress. Go and watch it. Her mother was a choir mistress. Her mother trained her, trained her, helped her, pushed her, told her you can do it. And then they came from the world to say, look, this is a talent. We can't let this talent just waste. And the truth is we have so many great talents in church. Help me appreciate that choir and appreciate the season summit as well. We have talents in church. We don't want the world to pick you up and then use you. God will help us in Jesus' name. Okay. I'm preaching on a subject friend of me. Hey, give the boss. How you doing? Are you okay? You didn't see me yesterday. God forgive you. I'm not forgiving you. God will forgive you. Open your Bibles. Friend means of the cross. Pastor Daddy actually inspired this message while still standing. Philippians chapter 3. I, I, dropped, I dropped a video on our pastoral platform. And then... Pastor Dari was sharing his own thoughts and he said, sir, can you, I think he privately charted me, I'm not, I'm not sure anymore, but I did it privately or did it uh, on that platform. He said, sir, can you please tell us about the enemies of the cross? Don't you think these preachers, by the way, what a few bad preachers, nasty preachers doing horrible things out there, you know them. So we picked up one of those things, we post it every now and then to encourage ourselves, inspire ourselves to stay on the straight and narrow path. We're living in very dangerous times, stay on the straight and narrow path. And I fear for the younger generation. I fear for them. I fear for the coming generation because if a few of us have done our bit and we're happy and you don't know how to define success, the major problem is how to define success. How to define it. How do I know I'm okay? And the next couple of months, I'll be taking ser several series around uh, not defining success, but redefining our work with God. It's very important. The Christian faith is a work, is a way of life. It's a walk with God. And, and the doctrines you take in, the teachings you take in may be sound and may be unsound. So while we we're discussing, he says, sir, why don't you just tell me a bit more about the enemies of the cross? That was his phrase. So Philippians chapter 3, verse number 18, with my text. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 18. Then I will share some thoughts about Palm Sunday. Goodness, I really, you know, brought it out of my mouth as if she's a preacher. She had no clue. For many walk of whom I have told you often. Please note this. This is Apostle Paul. And, and those pastors that are telling you Apostle Paul is wrong. I don't know which. I don't know where they're from. There's something wrong. There's something wrong. There's something wrong. Do you not know the day you attack a person that wrote to third of the New Testament? You're actually tearing the Bible. You have no grounds. You can't preach the book you've destroyed. You can't, you can't have another book. This is the one we are going to use. You can't, you can't, tell, you can't discredit Paul and you try to um, validate the scripture. It's not possible. You can't discredit the man that God used. If you don't know scriptures, say you don't know it. You don't know it. You can quote it and not know it. People quote and recite scriptures and they don't know it. It takes supernatural understanding to know scriptures. Luke chapter 22, Bible says, and God, Jesus, opened their understanding 
to know scriptures. It's not Christian religious education, what you call CRS. It's not. Oh. Luke 22. Jesus 24, I beg your pardon, opened their understanding. 24, verse 45, to understand scriptures. Opened. It can be closed. If you can open it, it can be closed. So Philippians 3 says to us, and like I've told you often, now tell you even what? Weeping. So Paul says, I'm in tears. I'm crying. As I speak this to you, I'm crying. That they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Can you imagine? They are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Matthew 26 verse 50 Matthew 26 verse 50 Then I will share my thoughts around the enemies of the cross and frenemies frenemies of Christ and, and Jesus said to him friend wherefore art thou come then came they and laid hands on him and took him. Father we pray that you open our eyes and you will help us to put scriptures together to make sense speak to us today Lord so that we do not become enemies or frenemies of the cross. In Jesus' name. You may have your seat in God's presence. The 26th chapter of Matthew that I just read to you, you find Jesus. Please, I'm trying to bring two thoughts together. And by the way, you know the meaning, I mean, the lingua is a modern day lingua. The modern day lingua, frenemies, if I'm not wrong, social media people created it, I'm sure. You young people, frenemies. Uh, I, was a, who's a frenemy? A friendly enemy. A combination of friends and enemy. So they call them frenemies. We used to have friends and enemies in our generation. We didn't have frenemies. You created frenemies. We didn't know, I mean, uh, uh, Minister Hike, I didn't know there was anything called frenemy. You know, I, I, I see all kind of stuff today. I, I see all kind of stuff, BFF. I don't know how you guys, I don't know how you guys just keep creating this slogan. I don't know how. But anyway, it's good to learn it. So I, I found out the word frenemies means someone who's supposed to be a friend, sorry, an enemy, but comes in the face of a friend. It's actually an enemy. It's an enemy, but comes out to you like a friend. But it's an enemy. It's an enemy. So that's why you call it frenemies. It's an enemy. It hates you. If you check the dictionary definition, they will tell you someone who's opposed to your ideas, opposed to your person, but comes out to you with a smile and does not like you. And there are many people like that around us in church. The fact that we're born again doesn't mean we're all truly, truly, truly uh, delivered also from our human nature. They smile, they laugh, they look at you, hey, you doing? but the truth is they're enemies. They oppose you. They don't like you. They wish you could kill you. They wish you can crush you. And you don't know them, Violet. How do I know this person smiling and all friendly towards me is not an enemy? So, 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 can we have frenemies of the cross? Oh, yes! Can we have those that Look on the outside, look good. It was sink <laughs> for the cross. But they are really enemies of the cross. And, and sometimes when you look at the things they do, or they say, you tend to like them. Because they say every right thing in the book. They say the right stuff. But not with their words, but their works. Their works are anti-cross against the things that Christ stood for. So we call them frenemies. When you look at them, I mean, there are some that we know are enemies of the cross. Not even trying to deny. We get a point? But some people you can tell. You don't know where they stand. Now, now Judas came to Jesus and gave him a kiss. Mwah! Mwah! Can you imagine? Not only did he come, he kissed. And Jesus looked at him and called him friend. Me, for where? I won't call you friend. I'll call you by your true name. Was Jesus being diplomatic? Was he being tactful? Was he being polite and courteous? He said, friend. As far as I'm concerned, watch me. I, because I use scriptures to design my own principles and philosophies in life. That's, that's who I am. I call you friend. Though you see me as an enemy. But what I call you is actually friend. Christ was not hypocritical. Christ was not deceitful. He actually knew that ah, you're my friend. Now, as far as I'm concerned. I will never think here towards you. Friend, do you betray me with a kiss? Do you betray me with a kiss? Friend, he didn't call the other guys that came to arrest him friends. He called only one person friend because of the relationship he had with the person. And now he viewed the person friend. So that's where I bring my friend and me together. I gave you Paul's idea, 
of enemies. And I gave you Jesus' words to us. His friend who was his enemy came with a kiss but came to sell him. Came to betray him. He came to push him out. To crucify him. He was standing. Do we go to the cross? He came with a kiss but he came with bad intent. People kiss on the outside and they kill on the inside. Write it down. They kiss on the outside. They kill. Both are K-I-S-S and K-I-L-L. -L. It's the kiss of death. Oh, they give you kiss on the outside. Oh, we love you, Heidi. Oh, you look great. But right there on the inside, they're killing you. They're murdering you. They, they don't want you to survive out of envy. Some even want to make money out of you. So be careful of these kisses you receive every now and then. It's called flattery. Do you know how many times people kiss us? Oh, they give us all kind of kisses every day, every week, every hour, on social media. Oh, they kiss you. And you tend to think they love you because they kiss you. The truth is, they don't love you. They want to use you. Because all he was doing was, this time around, I'm going to use you, I'm going to crush you. It was a kiss, but it was a kill. It was a kiss of death. Let me now go to Palm Sunday. My wife told me last week, we were together on vacation, and she said to me, Honey, I want to preach a sermon in church in Abuja. Uh, on blah 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 to commemorate Palm Sunday. I said, Ah, no, forget it. We don't do Palm Sunday in Pentecostal churches. Why are you doing Palm Sunday? It was a Catholic innovation. Dump that idea. So I thought, I dump it. What's all this nonsense about Palm Sunday? Go there and preach the word. Teach your people to love the Lord. I said, Okay, sir. So I went into my bedroom, came out, did some few things in my study. And when I was in my study, the Lord said to me, Was that your idea or my idea? I said, it was my idea, Lord. Do you want us to do Palm Sunday? He said, are you saying you will not celebrate, you will not commemorate, you will not remember what happened a week before I died? What she's asking you to do, was is it wrong? I said, sir, it's Palm Sunday. Catholic idea. He said, oh, forget Catholic idea. Read your scriptures again about tradition. Now listen to me, listen to me. There's, some, there's a problem with the word tradition. There's a problem. I struggle every week, every time with the word tradition. Because the word tradition to some of us that are Pentecostals comes with negative connotation. Oh God, tradition, tradition, tradition. Let's do something new. We don't want traditional people. And, and, and that's the truth. And we have scriptures to back it. After all, in Mark chapter 7, Jesus did not support tradition. Verse number 5. The apostles came to Jesus and they told him, Ma, sir, 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 your, 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 the, the Pharisees, I beg your pardon, came to Jesus. Your, your disciples eat bread with unwashing hands against the traditions of our fathers. Verse number five. What do you have to say towards that? And Jesus told them, watch me, watch me. The truth is, is right that it's a traditional practice, meaning paradoxes in Greek. Traditional practice, something that we met on earth and we just keep doing it. But you people, with your own tradition, also uh, fight the word of God, the commandments of God. So Christ said, any tradition that violates the word should be kicked out. He didn't say traditions are bad. Traditions keep us in line. But any tradition that violates the word should be what? Kicked out. And that's why I like what Paul said. Paul said it in a different way in 2 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 3. Let's go there and read verse 6. Paul said it, in a, he said it in a very harsh way. Paul's view on tradition is very harsh. In Colossians 2, he spoke against tradition. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, he spoke for tradition. So was he contradicting himself? No, he wasn't. In, in this place, he said, now we command you. Somebody shout command. There's no shout command. Let me hear you shout command. I'm not suggesting I'm commanding. I command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus, that you withdraw. Excuse me. Forgive me, I'm sorry. That must be the wrong Bible they are putting up there. Is that the Bible? Is it the Bible? No, it can't be the Bible. Is it the Bible? No, it's not the Bible. Is it the Bible? The Paul, under the Holy Ghost inspiration, tell us to withdraw ourselves so we don't mean don't be friends with people. Every brother, brother, believer that walk disorderly. These are scriptures we don't obey today. Because they will say you are judging. 
They say, don't judge, don't judge, don't judge. You know that judge thing? He said, withdraw yourself from a brother. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. A brother, hello, wow. Who walk disorderly? Not after the tradition which he received of us. Withdraw. If you see a brother who is rebellious, don't talk to him. Disorderly. I didn't write the scriptures. You know, Apostle Paul was very hard. People don't know it. That guy was a very hard man. I was telling Pastor Pedro, he came to see me yesterday for some issues that we were having in our church in Nigeria. He came for counseling. I was teaching him. I said, look, the Bible says this. You messed up here. You should have done it. It should be hard. You should be putting your foot on the ground here. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul was correcting an anomaly in the church. An anomaly. There was a guy that was sleeping with his father's wife. And the guy was a very rich man, presumably, or very influential guy in the church. And the church allowed him to just have a field day. He was still there in church. So Apostle Paul said, wait a minute, wait a minute. The whole chapter, chapter 5, was devoted to deal with that guy. Paul said, I, there, there's this guy in your midst. Eh, I understand eh, he's committing a sin that should not even be mentioned eh, with unbelievers. Unbelievers don't even mention it. And the person is in church. And the person is still carrying that gira gira. Gira gira. Eh, eh, come, come, come. Ah, 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 ah. And the person is puffed up. Puff, you see, that one should have his father's wife. Go back. Father's wife. I did. Father's wife. Hey, 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 hey. One should have his father's wife. Ah! Look at the next verse. And you are puffed up. Have you seen people in iniquity still shouting, doing gra gra? Have you seen them? Iniquity that's it doing gira Instead of it to be humble, you are doing gira You are puffed up. You have not rather what? Mourned. Bury your head in shame. That he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. Paul was a very strict disciplinarian in the spirit. Look at the next verse. He now says, I verily, I'm absent too. I'm not there physically right now. But I'm present in the spirit. I have one. No, please, from today, delete it. Because the Bible says, judge not. They say, judge not. I've judged already. Holy Ghost. I know you don't like the word judge because it sounds condemnatory to you. No, it's not. It just means sharing a position. I've given my view on this matter. The man is wrong. That's all. That the man is wrong means I've judged. You give your opinion on the subject matter, you've judged. The man is right, you've judged. The man is wrong, you've judged. That's what judge means. Judge means... A person that sits on his, on his stool. I call judge to say you are guilty or not guilty. You are right, you are wrong. Every time you say you are wrong to your wife, you've just judged. And I can't tell how many times I told my wife she's wrong. And sometimes you say she's right, you've judged. When she dresses well, see that you look good. I've just judged her. That's just judgment. To share an opinion on a subject means judge. We judge every day, everybody. The fact that you told me that what I've done is wrong, you just judge me. If you tell me judge not, you just judge me for judging. I don't like people that are not they're very intelligent. You just judge me for judging. So you have a right to judge, I don't have a right to judge. So those in the LGBTQ will say, why are you judging us? Okay, we are just judge us for judging you. You just judged. Because you just shared an opinion that my opinion is wrong. Eh, so your own opinion too is what? Eh, we're all judging. <laughs> all of us are judging. Forget it. All of us are what? Judging. When you share a view that nobody should judge, you just judged. <laughs> you just judged. So don't. If you want to say condemn not, I, I agree. Condemn means to say you are going to hell. I have no right to take them to hell. I would never condemn a soul. But I can judge you so. I can say you are wrong, but without saying go to hell. You get it? I can say, Uncle, you are wrong. Go. Uh -huh. That is, I just made my judgment on that issue. But I'm not going to say you are condemned. Condemned is a different issue. To condemn a person is to say you are going to hell. I have no right to say you are going to hell. I'm simply a servant. My job is to bring you to him, not to send you away from him. Is that clear? Is that clear? So no, let's go back to what, what Paul said. I'm sure I have missed church. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So he says, he that has done this deed, eh? verse 4. Verse 4, quickly. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, my spirit with you, 
The power of our Lord Jesus Christ is there. Look at all his building. You know? What should you do? Deliver such a one to Satan. Hey, whoa. For the destruction of the flesh. That the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. I will teach you that later in Bible study. Next verse. Your glory is not good. Ooh. 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 Deep. Underline it. Your glory is not good. So when I spoke against that pastor, I don't know his name, that carries himself and they opened the door for him. And the video went viral. People were calling me. They were happy. I said, all I said to the man is, your glory is not good. There's good glory. There's bad glory. Let's be careful to say, all glory is not good. Though. All boast. So what you are doing is not good. Do not glory that the Holy Ghost is upon you. Mm -mm. Because it's an act of grace. Did you start glorying over act of grace? Then you say it's an act of merit. Grace is unmerited favor. Something you do not deserve but given to you. So why are you now bragging about what you don't deserve? Boy, when you start bragging about it, you're saying you deserve it. It's no more by grace. It's now by works. After all, I fasted 30 days to get this power. Nobody gets power of God through fasting. It's an act of grace. Put your hands together. It's an act of grace. It's an act of grace. You don't pay for God's power. You don't pay. You don't tell me I paid the price. When I used to be young, I used to preach it, we paid the price. Which price did you pay? Nobody pays the price for the gift of God on our lives. That's why it's called grace and gift. It's called gift. He gave you gift. If you pay for it, it's no more a gift. If I go to pay, in a shop right. It's not my gift. It's mine. But if I stay in my house on my birthday, and Kule gives me a car gift. It's what? A gift. I did not pay for it. How can you not be bragging about a gift? Am I communicating? It's a gift. You sing well, I did. You sing well. It's a gift. I appreciate it, Lord. Thank you for this gift to be stored upon me. This mortal vessel. You filled me with insight. You filled me with gifts. Lord, I appreciate you. Don't have black as we are. We pay the price. Which price do you pay? For a gift. Have you seen a man paying the price of gift? They don't know scripture. We have too many untrained hands behind the pulpit. We're in trouble. Young people, they don't have jack of Bible. And they're, they're carrying gear again. It's there. Give it back. Give it back to me. Go me back. Now look at this Paul. The Paul you don't know. The Paul you didn't know. Look at it. The glory is not good. No, you know that a little level, living the whole lump. Next verse. I'm going back to my tradition now. Next verse. Is, 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 are they in media? Okay. Purge out there for the whole living, that you may be a new lump. As you are unleavened for Christ, our, even our cast is, is sacrificed for us. Next verse. He now left that place. He said, therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice, wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I love that verse. Next verse. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Ah. Yet, shh, 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 shh. This is where I'm going to. This is where I'm going to. Not the fornicators of this world, though. This is the most confusing verse. When Paul was speaking about sinners, sinners, he wasn't speaking about the unbelievers. He it was in church. There is very concern with you people. He said, Oh, not those ones. Oh, ah, ah. Those guys that go to nightclub, they're not born again. Not those ones. No. I'm not talking to you about the fornicators of this world. No. I'm saying, A hey, brother. <laughs> it's a brother I'm talking to you about, though. Look at it again. Or the covetous. 419, Yahoo, Yahoo. Or extortioners. Oh, I'd us. For then must you need to leave the world. All of us who have to be wrapped up today. Because they are there every day. We see them in, at work. They are unbelievers. We have relationships with them. Hello, how are you? How are you? They are smoking before you. I'm not saying do not greet those ones. You should greet those ones very well. We greet them well. Company with them. Company as in, hi, how are you? How, so, so as to bring them to Christ. He now says, but the ones I have now written to you not to keep company. If a man that is called a brother, somebody shout a brother, shout a bro, say bro, if you call it a bro, and is a fornicator, covetous, form one nine, greed, idolater, a railer. How can you be a brother and you're a drunkard, extortioner, abba, 
such a one, don't even eat. It's embarrassing Christ. Don't get, for what have I to do to judge them that are outside? Why? Do not judge them that are do not ye judge them that are within. So he says, those in the church we should judge. Those outside, God will judge. Look at the next verse. Next verse. He now says, but them that are outside, God judges. So those outside, who will judge them? Those inside. Those outside. Those inside. I didn't talk. I'm not talking. You must talk. Those outside. Those inside. We should, we should tell ourselves the truth. We should come to, I say, bro, bro, bro. We are doing 419. Bro. We are smoking. Bro. We call you bro, 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 bro. We should say bro in the bro way. You know, bro, bro, bro. Then the bro will feel bro, bro. <laughs> you beat your wife. Bro. Bro. You beat your wife. Bro. You're a Christian. Bro. Bro. You are doing this. Bro. But those outside, I don't, I can't call them bro. Let God judge them. But you, those of us here, let's use the word of God to talk to our... So they're now saying to us that we should not judge ourselves anymore. So we will not judge us when we are wrong. The world cannot judge us. We should help ourselves with the word so we can know better. We can become morally sound. That's what scripture says. So tradition is not wrong if it is not violating scripture. Is that clear? And Palm Sunday is a fantastic tradition that just reminds us of what transpired, what we call the Passion Week. What is called the Passion Week is the week that Christ died. Don't forget, it all started on a Sunday. People don't know that. Go to Matthew 21. So I will show you. Matthew 21. It all started on a Sunday. Christians don't know it. Everything started on, that, on a Sunday like this many years ago because he died on a Friday. And when they drew verse 1, when they drew nigh to Jerusalem, and when they, they were come to Bethage, and the matter of this, I said to them, Go to the village over against you. It was done. It was exactly that was the day, that was the week on Mount Olives, right there. It was a week before he died. Because a Friday, it was a Passover week. Listen, Passover was instituted in Exodus chapter 12. When God was taking them out of Egypt, God now said to them, Eat this ram, a ram. Get me a lamb. Make sure you kill that lamb. Make sure it's without blemish. And you eat it in a hurry. Chapter 12. Because that is your Passover lamb. Now, Jesus is a type. A type of our Passover lamb. First Corinthians chapter 5 just called him our Passover lamb. We keep the Passover feast. Not the Jewish feast. But a type of the Jewish feast. Jesus, on that Sunday, that week, rode, watch me, rode on a donkey. Watch me. The donkey is, was a symbol that used to carry burdens. They call it the burden-bearing meal. A horse was meant for royalty. He did not ride a horse. He rode a donkey. Symbolic. Because donkey were the things they used to carry load and burden. So he sat there as Christ said, I'm going to carry the burdens and the load of sin for humanity. As I'm walking into this place, I ride as one about to carry the burdens and the sins of humanity in five days time. And now the same week his brothers told him, listen, people are doing miracles. Go and do your own. He had gone there. So when he rode into the place, people came in, they put down their palms, they put down their decodlies, they said, oh, Zana, oh, Zana, they screamed, they loved him. In John chapter 12, the Pharisees say, wait a minute, the world is gone after him. That's why I'm always scared of social media. Ah, fame, fame can be deceitful. Young people, be careful. Fame can deceive. The same people on Sunday that called him Hosanna on Friday said crucify him. The same people. In one week, not one year. In one week, crucify him. The same city, the same people. That we, your video will go viral. For good things can go viral for bad things. Same people. Be careful. Crowd without a cloud is dangerous. 
I've always asked God to give me the cloud over my life. I don't want a cloud following me without a cloud above me. Because the cloud is God's presence. The cloud is man's approval. If you're a man pleaser, wanting people to like you, you're in trouble. Because they don't all like him. And so, so on that Palm Sunday, all, and so you must be careful. What he did was he actually was prophetically announcing what he was going to do on the cross. And on that Friday, that was the Good Friday. That was the Passover feast proper. That was the so that was the week. And so when we were all preparing for the Passover feast, he ate his own feast with his own people. This is my body, which is broken for you. This is my blood, which is shed for you. Drink, eat, because something's going to happen tonight. He left the place, went straight to where? Get the money. He bowed his knees. He cried to God. Oh, gosh, I don't want to go there. Oh, I'm going to preach that in second service. And there we find the clash of wills. His will and God's will. And they were going around it saying, God, I don't want to go through this. Please, can you take this away from me? Pain, suffering is not good. God said, listen, 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 listen. There's my perfect will. There's my permissive will. I will teach you guys one of these days. Do you want to be in the center of my will? Yes. You got to go through this. If you my permissive will, then we can edge it out. If I said, he said to God, in Mark, Mark, Mark's account, he said, all things are possible before you, oh God. Did you read that? I said, wow. Jesus was reminding God, watch me, you have the power to do anything. You can change this. So the problem is not what God cannot do does not exist. The problem is what man will do to submit to his will. Never in your life. I get angry when people tell me the obvious. That with God, all things are possible. I know. The question is not with God. The question is with you. Why do we keep blaming God for our own predicaments? I've never doubted that God can do all things. I've always asked God to allow me to be in his will. The problem is man, not God. In our Lord's prayer, thy will be done on earth. It's not, Lord, thy power do all things. Mm -mm. For thine is the power, the glory. God can and God will are two different things. Matthew chapter 8 verse 2. Don't forget it in your life. Give it to me. Matthew chapter 8 verse 2. I've preached on this several times. One verse of scripture that explains two different things. And so today, Africans like the first one. Power, power, power. Europeans like the will, the will, the will. They preach the will in some churches. They preach power in some churches. And behold, there came a leper. Worshipped him saying, Lord, God, if thou wilt, thou can. Somebody say, if thou will, thou can. Say it again. Say it again. That's all. Two different things. God's will, thou wilt. God can, God's power. You can if it's your will. I'm not doubting what you can do. I'm only asking, is it your... So what Jesus was doing at the cross was, it's not about God's power, it's about God's will. Oh, he missed that. So he said, he said God, I know you can do all things. I also know your will is for me to go to the cross. But can we negotiate the will? Can we tweak it a bit? Can we, you and I, please? I don't want to go through, this is painful. Can you give me another alternative? Is there an alternative to pain? I want the gain. Can, can we find another way around it? <laughs> With your power, you can create another way. I don't want this way. Because that is your will. So it was the wills that we're discussing here, not the power. Oh, it's the will. Because I know you can. All power. You can do all things. Give me Mark's account. Give me Mark's account. Because it's important for you to understand that he said you can do all things. God knew you can do all things. I don't have to debate that God can change it. God can move it. But will God do it? Give me Mark's account. You can do all things. But my will. Can we change? Can we discuss if you want us to do it? And God said, no, this is the path. You go through this or there's no other way. And that's where you and I struggle every day. I struggle up to today. I struggle to be in the center of God's will. All of us do. All of us do. We struggle to be in the center of God's will. We all know God can do all things. But we just want him to. It's not God's power. It's about God's will. Because our wills don't like, we don't like suffering. Nobody likes suffering. Nobody wants to embrace pain. Nobody likes to be in pains. I don't want to be in pains. But I, I, I just want him to, 
I want to be in the center of his will. So, so let me round up because of our, we have TLA, I think, today. I want to round up. And um, I've not even touched my message on frenemies. Because I was going to show you the, the frenemies of God. Six frenemies of God. Six frenemies of God. I've not even touched it. I've not even touched it. So, modern day frenemies or enemies of the cross. Because I don't want you to be one of those enemies. You, you might just be one of those people and you don't know you're an enemy of the cross. So write it down. The first one is Alexander the coppersmith. Those that fight men that preach the gospel. Be careful. Don't be an enemy of the cross. Every time you stand in the way of a preacher, Paul said, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 14 to 15. One man did him much evil. So when you're fighting people that push the gospel, you can you just be an enemy of the cross. You may just be an enemy of the cross. Number two, those who push the law above grace are enemies of the cross. Pharisees that crucify them on the cross. Be careful how you push laws, legalism, above the grace of God. Is that clear? Some people killed him, remember? We call the Pharisees. They nailed him to the cross. I don't want to be someone that will push the law above God's grace. I don't want to push my works above God's grace. Number three, those who merchandise and commercialize the cross. Oh, Jesus, help me. To make money from it, Judas Iscariot made money out of the pain of Jesus. Luke chapter 22, verse number three says, and Satan entered Judas. How? Physically, literally? No. No, through greed. Through greed. Judas was a greedy fellow. I have never, and by God's grace, I go to my grave. I will never fight a man for money. The, one of the biggest revealer of character is money. If you want to know who a man is, check what he fights for and who he fights, what he fights for. I have never, till I go to my grave, will never fight a soul for money. Cheat me, I don't care. Because I don't worship mammon. Mammon is a being. Bishop Mike and I have been talking about mammon, mammon. Mammon is a being that has taken the soul of the church. An apostle, Satan entered Judas. Don't ever forget that. Luke 22, 3. Satan entered Judas. Three words that are very powerful. How? How? How did he? And then Satan entered Judas. How? How did Satan enter Judas? How? Think, meditate. How? 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 Greed. Covetousness. Because this guy was the one keeping the money. Jesus did not ask him, how much money do you have in account? He was the one giving the account. He was already stealing so much money. He was the treasurer of his church. Yet, he now had to go and negotiate with the Pharisees. Come, come, come. I can give him to you. I can make money out of this business. Do you know how my heart breaks when I see pastors that make money out of church? They do church for money. It is evil to be in ministry for money. Evil. 60% of those that go to ministry is for money. This morning I saw another church opening my estate. Hey, the something great says every week a church is opening. What's wrong with these people? It's money, oh. It's money. It's money that won't give up. And you know that there are many muguns in Nigeria. Mumus in Lagos. It's money. How can you be in ministry for money? You're in ministry for service. For him. Everything they do is money. Inspired, driven. Ah, and so I, I, I'm really shocked that every your decisions are inspired with money. My money is ruling your heart. Satan enter Judas. Satan enter Judas. <laughs> I know you don't like it. Nigerians love money. You guys worship money. Ah, Nigerians love money. Yeah. Hey. We make decisions based on money. Friendship decisions based on money. If you see them say they love you, be careful. They love your money. Destiny decisions money. Satan, they commercialize the gospel. They commercialize, they do everything just for money. My heart breaks. If you are in ministry for money, I pray that God will forgive you. For that's not why to be in ministry. Ministry is a call of God on your life to serve him. To serve him. To, in fact, you should not expect money. Pastors, oh, Ghost, don't go there. Pastors are not meant to be rich. In your Bible, go on your Bible. It's more than the pastors that are not. You're not meant to be rich. It's not meant to be a, 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 a wealthy profession, exactly. It's like teacher. When I teach as a whole, those days, that's why some good churches, the pastors are not rich, they are poor. And they're doing God's work. Go and find out. 
In Catholic, everything that is owned is owned by church. They just pay your pay. Your, your, they give you your uh, house, your car. You don't own anything. The Levite in the Bible, the four tribes who are not supposed to own a land, yes or no? Because they don't own any land for you are my inheritance. Your job is also to serve my people. Being the other 12 tribes, you should not own any property. That's what God said to the tribe of Levi. So where did we get our own from? Where? We have a problem. Give us have a problem. You people love money too much in your generation. I pray that God will help you. All, all young people, not only you, all of you people, your generation. Number four, those who push politics and politicize the cross through ethnicity and other things are enemies of the cross. Pilate nailed him to the cross. Number five, those who desert him when things are tough, like Demas forsook the Lord. For the pleasures of this world are enemies of the cross. Demas forsook him. One disciple killed himself. Nine disciples deserted him. Peter was hiding around. Only John was by the cross of Calvary. All others were considered frenemies of the cross. Finally, those who aligned with their foes to bring Christ to the cross. There, was, there were two people, Pilate and Herod, were enemies, mortal enemies. If you go to Luke chapter 23, verse 12, Luke 23, verse 12, you find it there. Pilate, a Roman uh, uh, control consul, Herod, a Hebrew person, they became friends. See, the same day, the same day, Pilate and Herod were made friends together. For before them, for before they were, before they were, they were at enmity between themselves. They were enemies before that time. But that day, that day, they became friends. That's why I beg people, don't become a friend of my, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Be careful who you call your friend. I don't choose friendships based on common enmities. I choose friendship based on values. Oh, Ajiri is fighting. Are you Ajayi? So you now become Ajiri's friend because you two you are fighting. Are you Ajayi? And you and Ajiri don't have any values. Oh. You don't have anything together. You don't have anything in common. Oh. You now become friends with Ajiri because you have a common enemy. It won't last. That's what happened there. You people do not have any common values. But the only thing you have together is, is our enemy. Is your enemy too? Oh, we're not friends. We have a common enemy. Do you get the point now? And I see that happen to young people. They don't even have why. They don't know why they're fighting. David, David went to the battlefront. Remember the battlefront? And his brother said, we know why you're here. Blah, blah, blah. He said, that brother. He said, my brother, why are you angry with me? Is there no cause? First Samuel 17, I've used that phrase in my life. I never fight anybody without any cause. Don't say, sir, I'm fighting him. Let's fight him together. Why? You are not fighting, I'm not fighting him. One big preacher, I'll mention his name, called me many years ago. Somebody that I was very close to. And I, yeah, and I just was angry with me. Very angry with me. I was wondering why. So I went to have dinner with him. I said, sir, what, why are you angry with me, sir? I don't know what I've done to you. I know you're upset with me. I've noticed that you're not, I call you, you're not picking it. He said, well, uh, I saw Tony Rappo in your church. Uh, and Tony Rappo, Tony and I very close. Uh, Tony Rappo in your church. And you know Tony and I are not friends. So why are you friends with Tony? Uh, I said, sir, you can't choose enemy for me. I'm friends for me, sir. I told him, sir, you can't choose my enemy for me. You are fighting Tony. That's your business. Tony and I have no issues. So why must I fight Tony because I'm fighting Tony? That's no loyalty to Christ. I told him, I'm waiting dinner. I begged him, sorry, sir, I can't fight him. Is there no cause? I have no reason to fight him. You and him have issues. He had no issues with me. Do you, you understand the idea? Because he wanted me to fight him because he's fighting him. I don't have an issue with him. <laughs> why? Why? And people do that. That's what happened. The pilot and Herod became friends because of Jesus. Before that time, they were enemies. Be careful. That's not good relationship. Don't choose friends based on common enemies. Is there no cause? Put your hands together for Jesus. Rise to your feet. Rise to your feet. My time is up. The message is not done. But it's my time. It's time that it's up. Message is not done. It's time that it's uh, up. Is that clear? Message is not uh, uh, so <laughs> Have you been blessed today? Have you been blessed today? Check those six points and make sure you're not an 
enemy and just buy your eggs and say, God, please help me not to be a friend me or an enemy of the cross. I want to be a friend, a friend of the cross. Your Christian faith is, is revealed and evaluated regularly by your relationship with the cross. When the season of the cross, can you please buy your eggs and ask him to help you so that through you and through your life, the cross and Christ himself will be glorified. Spread that prayer in just one minute before I bless you all this morning and ask him, Lord, I want to be your friend, not an enemy of the cross. There are enemies of the cross and there are frenemies of the cross. I don't want to be one. This is a passion week. I will understand that you carried our burdens. Thank you for carrying our burdens. Thank you for going to the cross on my behalf. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being there. Thank you for always, always being my, my Messiah, my, 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 my Savior. Thank you, Lord. I appreciate you so very much. I appreciate him. Lift your voices and give him praise. 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 Thank you.